Hey, what's going on everybody? It's DJ Mojo and in this video, this is a special video. We're just getting started with something new. I'm here with my good friend DJ Jazz and I'm going to have this conversation with Jazz where you get to learn more about him. We'll be talking about DJ, gear, weddings, business, and all that good stuff. So DJs, if this sounds like you're interested, stay tuned in this video. So Jazz is right here and a quick introduction for DJ Jazz. Born and raised in Dallas, Texas, but now spinning in Southern California, DJ Jazz has played at some of the trendiest bars, nightclubs, and venues throughout Arizona and California. Jazz currently focuses his talents within the private event industry, specializing in weddings as he operates DJ Jazz Productions which is a full service luxury DJ experience catering to clients seeking an exceptional DJ performance, all while taking logistics, details, and aesthetics into account. So everyone, please welcome, make some noise for DJ Jazz. Thank you. Thank you. Dude, how are you feeling, man? How are you? Doing well, kind of ready for the holidays. Wedding season's over. Ready I to know, right? Now. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're glad you have you on. I know it's been a busy wedding season for all of us. Excited that you're here. Um, now, for those people who don't know Jazz too much or, or uh, wh why he's here, you know what? Jazz and I go way back. I mean, we we have several videos already on my YouTube channel. I'll leave somewhere uh, up there in the description or a card up here. But check out the videos we made. I mean, we've had uh, great talks and conversations offline, and now we want to bring this to you online so you can hear all about it. But but Jazz, um, maybe tell us a little bit more about your your story, a little bit about your, like, how did you get into DJ? Like, like and, and how many years have you been, been doing this for? Ooh, how I got into DJ. And I think probably like a lot of us love the music. Then came like the tech side of things and pleasing people at parties with music. And I think actually back in the day, I must've been like 12 years old before I was actually DJing per se, my dad would have these office parties at the house. We had a pool in the back and I would actually hook up, you're gonna laugh at this, but this was the start. This is how it started. Two stereos, like basically they each had like CD players, tape players, whatever. And I would be able to fade between each one because there's no like mixing equipment, right? So I would have literally four speakers, but they're all kind of facing from the same direction on the table. And that was kind of the start of it where I just was so fascinated how I can go from one track to the next and without that like lull or even gap. So just, there was no mixing, obviously. I couldn't control anything. When, I mean, I actually could kind of cue it though because I had my headphones in each, each boom box per se, right? And you can like go from one to the next. So um, I was able to do that. That's kind of how I got started. And then once I fell in love with that, I actually started in Dallas. Uh, working for a couple companies and myself just doing really like anything I can get my hands on uh, birthday parties bar mitzvahs house mm -hmm. parties um, anything and did quite a bit of stuff even for like high school events once I was uh, late in the high school and then I went into college wasn't sure if I was gonna like continue DJing I had a love of media production and film production like all media arts but pretty quickly I met somebody there got a pair of turntables and that really took off. So we started a business, started DJing like every week in college, uh, almost became like an obsession, true, true passion. And then I started doing clubs and bars out there um, and then did an internship in California, Santa Barbara, which is where I met my partner now. And that's how I started by accident, really like marketing in Santa Barbara. And for a little bit, um, I would kind of like basically lie to some of the bar owners out there to say that I lived there because I didn't want them not to hire me but I go out like handing out my mixtape you know hey hire me at your bar whatever it is but they didn't know I lived there but I was flying in like quite a bit just to see her whatnot so it kind of worked out kind of paid for the flights paid for like the travel and all that kind of stuff um, and then I ended up just moving to Santa Barbara for a few years before I ended up settling in Los Angeles here that's awesome and you still do yeah. weddings up there in Santa Barbara yeah, I would say like 75% of my business is still in Santa Barbara, just because of reputation and just where it's marketed from the get-go. But I do do um, a fair amount of stuff in LA as well and like surrounding area, like really all Southern California. And I do travel, I do go back to Arizona, not because of 
like past history with Arizona, just people, uh, it's just coincidence. Like people saw me at a wedding out here, but a lot of people live in Arizona that have weddings out here, a lot of destination weddings in Santa Barbara. So they would see me at weddings that I DJ there and then have me come DJ their weddings in Arizona, which has been pretty cool. I would love to do more of that because that's definitely a fun experience just being able to travel and do stuff like that. Right. Well, well, that's amazing. I think going back to your store, I mean, I think we've all been there, right? Like just starting off the ground up and just having a passion for music and building our way up. And now, I mean, look at you, I mean, you're, you're traveling and, and doing all these things. And I mean, it really comes to show that, I mean, wherever people need music and a good DJ, they're, they're willing to pay someone to do that. For so, sure. I mean, yeah, that that's, and now you're in LA. Do you do weddings right now or what else do you do? You do? I mean, for sure, 80% of what I do is weddings, but this time of the year, or really for like the next couple of months and sprinkled throughout the year, I do like corporate events for companies. But really at this point, I think in my career, I certainly am specializing in weddings and trying to be the best wedding DJ. So I feel like all my time and energy is certainly devoted to being the best at that but it is nice to not only do weddings. I think like I would say to any DJ, try not to only do one type of thing. I think if you're able to get your hands on other stuff, it makes you a better DJ. And I think I am a better wedding DJ, or just overall better DJ because of my past experience DJing like on a weekly basis in mm -hmm. bars, lounges and clubs, both in Arizona and California. And then it was actually an, a total accident how I got into weddings, not to get on a tangent, but I was DJing at a bar. Somebody came up to me and was like, is there any way you could do that, but at my wedding? And this is, I mean, I had done like two or three weddings before this. I was like, yeah, sure. Didn't really know, like, like not even comparable to like what we know today here, right? But I did it and I kind of liked it and I saw the, the vibes and sensation and I feel like I wanted to take that to the next level. And there's this whole stereotype that is still there, but there's this whole like cheesy wedding DJ thing that people just think that that's what it is and it doesn't have to be. And I think that's slowly going away and eventually that probably will go away completely. But I was destined to make sure people did not have that attitude uh, towards wedding DJs because I was doing a lot of what I was doing at a bar or a club, very similar, but just at a wedding. Clearly the music's gonna be catered towards that wedding market mm -hmm. and there are different, different styles in what you do, even like with the way you mix. It's not as quick, but it's still quick. So right. I took that and brought that sensation, that vibe and energy into the wedding market. Dude, that that is awesome, and it comes to show like there, like I don't think any of us, any one of us like decided, hey, we're gonna become a wedding DJ, or I want right. to become a wedding DJ. It, it just falls into our lap, and people around us, or a group of friends, our, our circle of friends, family, like, hey, I know a DJ. Can you DJ my wedding? <laughs> it, it usually starts sure. off with just the people you're around, but taking all of that, you're, you're completely right. It does just for your experience, and and I could say the same is like when we have experience not just weddings but all these different kinds of events is really building our skill set so when we do do a wedding you know it's it, it really shows that hey we can deliver much more than just playing music uh, yeah so but one one thing i, I definitely want to touch up on and and um i'm just really excited to, to to dive deep here and and for those people who who don't know i mean jazz and i like offline i mean we've been talking about dj speakers our gear ceremony setups and um and and just like marketing sales and just all of that good stuff i, I kind of want to get into the juicy part have you uh like take the limelight a little bit more and and maybe in a quick summary like why do you think dj should listen to you or, or like hey what, what, what from your experience like you know, do you, like what what kind of topics or bullet points like you, you want to let other DJs know, and then we can dive deep into those topics. What are you referring to specifically, just in general? Like, yeah, in general, I, I think the ceremony setup we were talking about. Okay. Yeah, or, yeah. or is there anything else that you want to share? That hey, like stay around this video because you, you got something to share. Well, I would say general theme. I feel like all DJs are trying to figure, and I, I feel like this just it's always the talk with a lot of wedding DJs. And obviously we're in these like groups and we get to see whether it's like Facebook or local groups or conventions. Everyone's always talking about like, I want to raise my price, but how can I? And they don't ever really think past like what I can do to get better. And I think, I think first and foremost, like regard, even not even talking about equipment, I think be become a better DJ. I think that is super important because if you can sell your talent, that is ultimately the most important thing 
at the end of the night when people are dancing and they've had a great time and they realize the appreciation of your DJ and style, that will lead to more gigs quicker than anything. It's not actually the equipment per se. But with that said, if the equipment's all set right, you can then focus on your DJ skills and let the equipment just do its thing because you're not sitting there fussing, wor worrying about like, what do I need to upgrade? You're not nervous, you're not itching. I know like with like mic, rece mic receivers and wireless units, people always are looking like to upgrade or why isn't it working and stuff like that. So if you can get all that perfect, I think you can then concentrate on being the best DJ, if that makes sense. Yeah, L let's yeah. elaborate that in yeah. into a little bit more, like becoming a better DJ in terms of of, of how like like actual mixing or song selection or um, what oh, what activities yeah. do you think that they could be better on? Well, there's, I mean, what makes a better DJ, I guess, right? I mean, I think ultimately, yeah, song selection for sure is super important. I would say that might actually be the most important. Like when I see a DJ, I think like any good DJ is going to be in the mix, but it's that, it's how we play those songs and the song choice with the timing. So practicing, coming up with cool sets, practicing different things and like trying it out, sometimes taking risks, the reward is so worth it because I feel like you can separate yourself as a DJ by a lot of times, honestly, the song, the song choice and like the timing of the song when you do it. So in like the way you mix in and out of it. So it's kind of everything. It's not like one element makes a DJ better. So if you can do all of that, I think that definitely makes a better DJ. Practice makes better, not perfect in my eyes. So I'm constantly trying to come up with like, even with not on the turntables, like just in Serato coming up with like cool sets, cool ideas that I think certain songs blends would work well together and then testing them out. And then the real test is actually at the wedding. And then when you get that reaction, it's worth the reward, all that hard work. You're like, ah, oh, that moment. So I think that's what makes the better DJ. So worrying about the equipment is not, I don't think the best approach because to me, that's like the, it's not the least important thing, but if you're worrying about equipment, then something's wrong in my eyes. So with that said, it's easy to say that because it's expensive to get the good stuff. Uh, and yeah. also you get what you pay for, but it's also a matter of knowing what to buy and trying stuff out. I mean, when I first tried, I would try stuff out and be like, that didn't work. And I thought it was gonna work and would quickly upgrade. and. Finally now, like I have a pretty good setup that I don't feel like the HD upgrade because I would say it's pretty much perfect in my eyes in terms of what I do. So right. where were we yeah, going I, with that? <laughs> yeah, no, I think I've been there too, man. I mean, a lot of us are into gear and we always want to find that perfect system. And I think there comes to a point where, yeah, after trying out to see what works for you, I mean, everyone's different and whatever right. resonates with your style. But then afterwards, you know, there gonna be a, there's going to be a point where, you know what? It's working. It's good. It's working. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? And you can save money. You know, hey, everything's good. And it's sometimes we're, we're off to buying so many new things. But once we find something that's good, now what's the next step? Is, yeah. like we said, improving your DJ skills to really stand out. Um, yeah. And, and, and funny enough, uh, it, you know, people won't really notice the gear that much. They just want to know. know. They really just want it to just work. And then after that, it's how you use the gear that will really make a difference. It's like, oh, wow. Like, I noticed that they felt that. Yeah. You know, so. And they're, they're assuming it's going to work, too. I mean, like, I would say over the last few years, I have even once I've got my setup kind of where it is, I still remind it like they it's not that they don't care. They just assume like, of course, you're bringing great stuff. Like, why would you not bring great stuff? I'm hiring you. So they are expecting good stuff. The problem lies, I feel like the most, like where people will notice more than anything is it, it's the wireless microphones. I feel like that then, and I see that when I go to even like friends weddings or like family weddings or something where everything's pretty decent with the DJ, but then like there's wireless issues. And that seems to be just a lack of knowledge, um, a lack of like just investing into the right equipment, um, kind of all the above. So if you want to dive into that, I can kind of talk about what I do think you can use to your advantage in terms of charging more, um, if you're not doing it with your DJ skill or you want to do it maybe not necessarily with the equipment, you can do it with like selling a better quality service in terms of why people are coming, right? This is a wedding ceremony. So having ceremony sound, I always tell people I take that just as seriously as my DJ. You do not want to have like vowels cutting out in the middle or people can't hear anything because people will talk about that. and if 
I can promise you they do. I mean, I've had people come up to me asking, hey, did you hear, like, not from my stuff, but from other DJs when we were at the weddings, like, hey, did you notice that? And all that kind of stuff. It's like, well, of course I did, like, you know. So like if right. people are, if other people that don't care, don't know anything about sound are noticing that kind of stuff, it's not a good look. And you never know, you don't want to get that one couple that is furious because of that. And then you've already got into the wedding. You haven't even started DJing, cocktail hours haven't even started. You're already off on a bad start. And the energy, you're already almost like just wanting to get out of there and get done with the gig. So if you can eliminate all that again, and then concentrate on being a better DJ, I feel like your life as a DJ is just so much easier as like a private event, mobile wedding DJ kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I, w- I want to add on to that. Ceremony yeah. is so important. It's it's the first oh, it impression is. of you, your service, yeah. and what's really going to set the tone for the rest of the day. I mean, if, if so you're already is. having some audio trouble or audio issues early in the day, man, you have to make up for that like later. Like you, you really have to do your A game afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And no reason to be in that position if you can, you can do everything you can do to avoid it, right? But like, I guess nothing in life is guaranteed with any of this kind of stuff. But if you can do every single thing that you're able to do, then the chances right. of something like that happening are just greatly minimized. So right. Right. But yeah, there's no right or wrong either. I don't want to feel like I mean, yeah, I think people probably should listen to me like you were asking earlier, but it doesn't mean like my way is the only way. In fact, I would imagine most people don't do it my way either because they don't know um, or they don't want to invest the time because it is a little bit of setup time and practice. It can't just be like you buy the equipment and go out and do it. And mm-hmm. I would say that's kind of the only downside of the way I do it. But like once you do dial in the sound, it's pretty much set for from there on after. Yeah. So. Well, awesome. So I think this, this is a great segue into the yeah. next part of the conversation that I really want to share is your ceremony setup. And and going back to what you're saying, like, yeah, everyone does it differently. And and maybe what we're about to share with you, you can pick and choose whatever you like. You can try things out and you can experiment yeah. with things. And um, I, I want Jazz to uh, explain his setup and I and he sent me some photos I'm going to I'm going to share you my screen and maybe jazz as I share my screen you can talk about what's on the image and um, got kind of guide people about like hey what the situation like what is like what's the use case I, I'm sure the pictures that you sent me were at different weddings perhaps and just want to share more about uh, what you have and then also like the the application like like you know uh, for that particular use case. I, I know there's different kinds of ceremony setups, like, and I'm sure you've probably messed around with, with so many out there. Before I share with everyone, you what your setup is, why do you have it the way it is? So I'm a strong believer in the way I have it set up, which is, I think what I've noticed, at least like talking to people. And again, it doesn't mean there's a right or wrong here, but what I've noticed is most DJs will set up some type of speaker on a stand, have the back of the speaker be like almost a mixer section, have an iPad computer or whatever. They hook their mic receivers either on top of the speaker or on the trays, and they stand next to the speaker to operate it for the ceremony. And whether you're standing or placing the speaker front, side, or back, that's a whole separate conversation. But what I don't like about that, and I feel like maybe DJs aren't aware of what that looks like, afterwards and what i mean by that is in the photos is i noticed looking at photos and i maybe i have a leg up because my partner's a wedding photographer as well and so i would see these wide angle shots and the dj would be like here's all the guests and then you have the dj like on the very edge like two feet away from like that last guest over there and it would almost ruin the shot i mean a lot of times it would it would ruin the shot and so I also think for me doing it, because I've done it like that several times. And when I first got started, like I thought that was the only way. I didn't even think there was no other way I would do it. I also felt a little, and this just made me me personal, I felt a little uncomfortable being so close to these people, like controlling it, because I'm not a guest, but I almost felt like a guest. And I don't I wouldn't say like people were like, what are you doing here? It was kind of obvious I'm doing running the sound, but there definitely would be this like uncomfortable, weird kind of energy. And it, it clear it's not like over the top or anything, but that's what started me. And then I saw all the pictures and then I started realizing if I can step away from that, how that will help overall with the aesthetics and looks. And I took that just all the way, even including not using handheld microphones. So I only use lapel. Um, I will use a handheld microphone for readings and speeches, but I also use a lapel kind of for the same reasons. 
is it's those photos. And when you look back at the photos, which you're not gonna notice really on the wedding day, everyone is not paying attention to a mic stand so much, but when the couple looks back at their photos and it looks like the couple's kissing the microphone, it's not the best look. And again, I do think I had the leg up because I can see right next to me in the next room, wedding after wedding where DJ is doing that. And I see these photos of her spending all this time trying to do the best to either on the day capture it or edit some of that stuff out or just be like that photo got ruined because the microphone's literally covering like that whole area sometimes. Mm -hmm. Depending on like, the angle, you have to be more strategic when you shoot. And what I was like, what can I do to make it easier for the photographer on the day of and in post? So, and ultimately I do think everything I do has its place in terms of sounding better as well. So what I do is I set up my speaker or speakers. A lot of times I use one, but a lot of times I use one on the other side. And I send a wireless feed to the other speaker. And what I mean the other side is like the other side of the aisle, right? And then I go back wherever I feel necessary. So I place the speakers in the ideal situation, which can be different for every venue. Sometimes it's front, mid, back. It really depends on the venue and different things. Then I place myself out of the way I don't know, 20 feet, sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 50. So again, the idea is to get out of the way. And then what it is, is, and we can probably bring up the pictures at this point, if you want, that you have sure. that I sent you, which it's just a rack of some equipment that I have found really works. And it's not like you need all of this. It's actually not overly complicated. And that's the thing I feel with. I've talked to other DJs about ceremony sound. They're like, oh my gosh, that's just like so much to set up. Funny thing is, I have timed the difference between like doing the speaker stand and setting the rack up and doing it my way. It's about three minutes longer to do it my way. And I, I think it's worth it just for the photos alone, but just for comfort uh, of not being right next to them. And also you can sometimes get out of the way and then like cover yourself in shade, which is another thing of not being like right next to the guest. Cause that would even draw more attention. If like <laughs> now you're the sound person at the ceremony and then like you're drawing some kind of either like canopy or umbrella or whatever. So what I've done in this rack, you can see in the photo is I just had QLX D receivers. I strongly believe in those. I know um, EV and Sennheiser, Audio-Technica, everyone makes a good wireless system. I'm not gonna say you have to use QLX D but it has been super, super reliable. And I think you use it too, right? I do, I do. Yeah, it's just been awesome. I like the fact that it's digital in terms of the, the way it transmits the audio. So don't really notice any delay and you could use it to transmit audio the same way you can an XLR cable. So there's no like loss in quality. In fact, I've even used it for transmitting audio to subwoofers on the dance floor. And so you get the full frequency spectrum and huge range. And the paddle antenna that I use is just to maximize the range even more. I actually use, most of the time I only use one. So you can see there's one right there and then I have the normal half wave antenna right next to it. I see it, yeah. Yeah, it probably would even be better if I used two, but just upgrading to the one definitely makes a difference. And it's just like super, so you can see where the signal is. Like if you look at the screen right there, it's pretty decent. And we have any, like, if you go to the next photo, you can see I'm easily 200 feet away from where the actual officiant is. I'm okay. pretty far from where actually the officiant is. So that's the speaker. See. That bag mm -hmm. next to it is not mine. I think that's actually the photographers or the videographers next to that speaker. Yeah, I get away. And then what I do is I send a audio signal wirelessly using QLXD to that first speaker right there. And I also send it to a second speaker as well. So they're both receiving the same signal. It's not from one speaker, and then that speaker sends another wireless signal. So both speakers were seeing the same wireless signal from the same transmitter from that rack. And you can't see that because the transmitter is like on the back side of the rack. Summarize just a little bit, like your setup is very unique in the sense that how it looks in terms of you're you're not getting the way of the photographer you're considering other other, other vendors yeah. who are going to be there and and the guests i'm making sure that you're not too close um and i guess you you found a way that everything's wireless for the most part yeah. in terms of sound and audio is balanced so both sides of the wedding aisle can can hear you pretty right. well i use the sure cool xd as well and um you're the one who helped me out in terms of using the Bose T4S and, and T8S yeah. and 
I'll leave That's a next video thing. card yeah. up there or down down in the description below if you're interested. Yeah, I, I agree with you with the antenna. Uh, I, I have some questions for you, and then and we can talk more about your ceremony setup real quick, just so yeah. that way, I, I'm, yeah. I'm sure, I'm people are looking at this like, well, what is this? Like, what does this do? And, uh, Probably. Like, I don't want to overwhelm people because it is a lot when you like first see it. Even like when I say that loud, it sounds, especially because I'm speaking so much, it seems like so complicated, but really once you set it up, it's quite easy. So so here's my weakness, okay? Yeah. I don't use yeah. a rack <laughs> system at all. And right. I, I guess some DJs tell me, Joe, you know, you have to <laughs> use a rack, but for, I do it for my own reasons and, and I don't wanna get too much into it. But for those people who, who don't know much about rack systems, and uh, I have another video too with my other DJ friend, DJ Kanoya, great guy. He has his own mm -hmm. ceremony set up as well. So you, you are right. There is only one cable leading to that antenna and then one half wave right here. You have two sure uh, receivers. And normally there's two half wave antennas for each of them, but you combine it to make yeah. it only two. Is this what this top unit for is yeah. for? Is like a combiner? Yeah, not necessary at all. Um, and they're kind of expensive, but it mm -hmm. makes, again, the setup faster right we're all about efficiency and it makes it cleaner because running two antennas i can actually run more than two qlxd receivers if i wanted to they uh, yeah there's just two that i use i use the lapel like i said and then i have it handheld for like readings and speeches and also like as an extreme backup or whatever so yeah wow. both of those they also get power you don't have to use the big power blocks for the qlxd uh receivers mm -hmm. that sure unit on top not only does the antennas, but it sends power to the receivers. So your rack is just less clutter and like in the inside and easier to set up and just overall makes a cleaner setup. Don't need it though. Like that's one that probably like the last, like if you're like on the fence of like, man, it's just getting expensive. That would be something that you can leave off. And the same thing with that bottom row piece, the DBX AFS not need it but i mean i love having it it's kind of like those are like luxury items per se within my ceremony setup well, well well let me ask you what is that dbx below yeah so without getting like too crazy into it because you can set it up different ways but the way i use it is i actually have the qlxd receivers going into that first and then out of the dbx into that bose t4s and what that does is it is a feedback suppression on the spot. So the way I have it set up, it's all live. So if there's any kind of feedback, it will immediately notch just like it can on the T4S manually with the parametric EQ, except this is doing it for you live and a lot faster than you would be able to do it. And it's definitely a nice piece of mind that I can almost walk away and if it feeds back, you, you would hear it. Let's say you hear the feedback, a little high frequency and then immediately it's gone, which is really mm -hmm. cool. It's like just somebody's doing it. And a lot of the speakers now have this built in, like the EV verse has it. Pretty sure the Maui, some of the Maui stuff has it. And I think you will see this. I mean, it, there's no reason not to have it. It's very easy to include in all these powered speakers now. Um, the downside in using those a lot of times is it's like a global. So like it will take away from the music or it will take away from any other input. So what's nice about this one is I'm able to run each of the QLXD receivers into each input on the DBX. Mm -hmm. And I mean, having a separate rack unit is definitely gonna be ultimately more sophisticated and better than seven, like a about like right. a powered speaker doing it for you. So that's why I say it's a luxury item. It's yeah. not necessary, well, I mean, but it's awesome that I have it. Yeah. That, no, that is great. I mean, just for the fact that you're able to to suppress the suppress any feedback, and it goes to here directly before it even goes to the mixer. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so you have the secret okay. ingredient, and you know, I should stand behind this, uh, is is that Bose mixer though. I do think that is kind of how I'm able to form the sound I do without that mixer. Um, it would be a lot harder to do what I do in terms of getting that sound because of the lapel microphone. I think if you're using handheld, you could probably get away with any mixer, but what makes that mixer so good besides being super small and digital and able to like save scenes and in safe settings is the fact that each input has its own DSP. And one of the DSP features within that mixer is that parametric EQ. And I think that is definitely the secret sauce that Mm. I know QSC has like their touch mix mixers, which are a lot bigger. Same thing. It's doing the same thing. It just does this in a small format. And if you've never used a parametric EQ, it's game changer for dialing out feedback or just like shaping your sound. It's just thinking of it like a, a different way of doing EQ than a graphic EQ 
Um, I don't want to go on top, but you can like go YouTube what a parametric EQ does and you'll see how much better and, uh, and tighter you can control the sound and shape your sound, especially for cutting out sound. That's where I, I don't use it really to boost things so much. It's more to cut out frequencies that I don't like. And I do it even with like the, the music per se. If there's like certain rooms I play and I'm like, hmm, sounds a little harsh on these frequencies because of the way the walls are hitting or whatever the sound. Yeah. yeah. Parametric cool. EQ is a lifesaver. That's great. No, I, I totally agree with you on that. And and I appreciate you, you showing me about the Bose T4S. Quick question yeah. about this guy, because it's sticking out right now. Is it on a slider? So it comes out and then goes back in? Or how does that work? It's not on a slider because it's not that I'm aware of that they make like any half rack slider. Maybe they do, but I don't think they do. But there's not a lot of room back there. So one of the things also is that rack, it might look kind of big in the photo but it's not that big, it's shallow. So when you buy racks for you guys that don't know, you can buy standard depth. Sometimes they even have extended depth, which is just how deep it goes inside. So for me, again, since I knew I was setting up a rack and in general, I think we all should think like, how can we get the smallest thing with doing the job appropriately? So I bought this for the most part, the smallest rack out there depth wide. I mean, every dimension, right? So I don't know if those shelves would even be able to fit. Um, but all it does is it just goes in there. It's basically pretty free behind there. So like when I'm done with the gig, that just kind of gets pushed in there. Oh yeah. So, so whenever you're, 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 you need it, you just take it out. You, you just take it out. You're, yeah. You're, it's literally, you're, it's like, it's like this that. kind of move. It's all pre-wired back there. So it's not, it's like, I literally take it out three inches, just enough to be able to control the stuff. And then when I'm done, I push it right back. It's like a two second thing. There's not, Ooh, I got to like move this cable. It's all pre-wired. So it's just an in and out kind of thing just to close the lid really to open and close right. the lid yeah okay well it's awesome man all right so so yeah. let, let's move on to the next picture anything you want to share with with this one right here um no the only thing you can't oh you mean on that photo yeah this photo yeah this new photo yeah so that's kind of below what the rack is and a lot of, so i have um a couple different like table options that i use for the ceremony but what i try to do actually at most venues is find something that i could use there without using a table if possible so on the previous picture i forgot what that was over there i was setting it on but a lot of times the venue will have something you can kind of put it on uh, but if not you should have some type yeah there's it's some i don't know what that is it's like a round thing underneath a barrel um, oh yes yes I, <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, but I also have like a small little fold up table and I have a bigger table that I use, but all that's below in this picture here is the battery that powers that system. So that all that rack comes out with one cable and plugs into that battery. And there are a lot of batteries out there. I mean, I feel like everyone talks about the Jackeries, there's EcoFlow. I'm not going to say which one's better than the other. I like this one because of the uh, the function and like the way it's designed dimension wise. Some of the other ones have these handles on top that are permanent. You can't like fold them down and you can't see in that photo, but if you take off those sure bags, the handle goes up and down. So it's not permanently attached. You can actually stack them. So like in the, in the vehicle, when you pack stuff, I can like almost stack or like easily pack stuff in and out. And even when you load it on a dolly or when you're carrying it, it's just easier. Uh, that, that but makes that's a, a Yeti. <laughs> yeah, it's just a Yeti battery. I mean, they all kind of do the same thing, but I can get crazy amount of time. People always ask me like, what, that's the 500 X and I can get, I can get like 10 to 15 hours off that. That's pretty good. So, with, it's pretty with good. Yeah. With, with that. Um, that's with one speaker and the rack hooked up. So, um, if you didn't have the speaker hooked up, it's even more, I mean, it's the rack that like all the stuff in there doesn't take up the actually what takes up the most is if you're charging your laptop, that will take <laughs> up the most, but like the T4S and the sure receivers and even the AFS and the antenna distribution on top, it, they, they don't draw a lot of power. Um, mm. and I have three of these guys. So in this picture, I also have my, I use a Bose L1 compact for the ceremony. And that speaker is also powered off this Yeti in this situation. But on the previous picture, I'm like 30 to 40 feet back. And so that's where I would use the other Yeti battery to power the other speaker. And you can actually see that in the photo. And behind the speaker, you can see there is the another Yeti battery powering that speaker right yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, I, I can, uh, this is going to be very beneficial for those DJs who do a lot of outdoor ceremonies. Yeah, that's perfect. And 
and you could if if you wanted to eliminate like that battery right there since we're all about battery powered speakers now um there you can use whatever battery powered speaker you don't have to use the l1 i mean the l1 compact is not battery but like the s1 pro and s1 pro plus are ev versus I mean, it's tons actually my if i wasn't using the bose l1 compact which i do swear by for ceremonies but they don't make it anymore the ld simpson the maui 5 do you know that one maui 5 the, that's uh which one's smallest that? one it looks just like this one it's basically a direct copy of the bose l1 compact almost like everything about it the size the shape and if you were far away you would actually think it was the bose mm. the basically it has the two plastic columns and then the array on top and then the bottom is the woofer except mm. on the maui version you can choose to have either the normal pa uh passive version with obviously there's an amp inside but there's no battery but they also make a battery powered version of the maui i think it's called oh, the maui i know we're talking Go. about now yes it's been, it's been yeah. a while since i've, I've been a while i've heard the name mm -hmm. so i'd be all over that if i was like starting over especially because i don't even make these both speakers that's what i would get and then that would eliminate the battery back there completely mm. um which is nice um so you wouldn't have to use I that battery over there yeah. How many battery packs do you have? Is one here and then one for your rack? One for the rack, but then if I was doing another speaker on the other side, it would be that exact setup you saw in that photo. So another battery with that Bose L1 compact there. So that's why I'm saying, I think if I was to recommend starting with somebody, the Maui goes that are battery powered would be probably a smarter solution overall. Got it. Um, and then that little bag on top is super important. I don't know if you can see there's kind of a small bag that I have placed on top of the bottom of the base right there. So that's basically pre-wired uh, QLXD receiver and cables that go into the L1 compact. And that's per for me, it's like permanent. I say that, but it's like, it is kind of permanent for my setup. I never take that bag off. It's actually held together with like two little straps and that stays on. So when I set up for the ceremony, I just plop that on the ground and it's ready to go. So when I say it takes three minutes longer to set up, I mean, I'm not kidding. And that's my whole, I guess, if you want to get into debate, like, oh my gosh, it's so much more work. It is a little bit more equipment, but time-wise, it's not that much more because to set that speaker up is a minute, mm. a minute. Mm -hmm. And I'm not having to attach like any kind of trays. The only thing I have to do is plug it into the battery. And then I go back to wherever the table is for that rack, plop that down, plug it into the battery, and we're ready to go. So it's very, Got very it. fast. Um, the the, tr the tricky part is finding reliable wireless because I am sending that signal from that rack to that speaker wirelessly, no cable. So the whole thing is wireless, which makes people super nervous when I talk about it. But I've been doing this for, <laughs> I've been doing it like this for like five, five, six years. This is the exact same setup for ceremony. Um, I have never, ever had a dropout, like ever. Damn. And that's not like, it's you can't tell because you're kind of compressing that photo, but I'm definitely 50 feet away from there. Uh, from mm -hmm. that first speaker. But I also, 50 feet would be like, I wouldn't want to go more than 50 feet because if you go more than 50 feet, then it's also harder to mix the sound. Cause then you start, like you're, then you're too far out of the way. So you're not mm -hmm. going to get a good guide on like where you need to adjust the sound. So normally like in that first photo where you saw me, that's where I am, where I'm like a few feet away from the rack, the speaker's almost right next to it, um, but mm -hmm. not necessarily. So I have the like comfort knowing the QLXDs can send an insanely wireless, like strong wireless signal. And then uh, if you have the two speakers, which is another reason sometimes I would say more often than not, I use a second speaker is what if that first speaker lost signal? Well, if I'm sending a wireless signal from that rack, which you can't see it, the transmitter is a little body pack in the back. It sends it that same frequency to both speakers. So God forbid one speaker cuts out, I doubt would cut out both of them at the same time. Even though that's never happened, I know it's even more of a peace of mind to know when I run two, it's even going to be stronger, not just for sound, but even more reliable for wireless. Does that make sense? What I mean, like same wireless yeah. signal going to both, like basically two, two receivers. It's just like TV. We can all tune into the same TV station or radio station. So if you set your frequency to the same frequency, then put your receivers on that same, you could have, I mean, probably a hundred receivers on the same channel as uh, and receiving the same signal if you wanted to. Right. No, I, I, I've gotten some questions before in the past talking about wireless sound and they were asking questions about exactly just that. Can can both of my speakers have the same wireless sound? And the answer is yes. Just set it to the right frequency that your transmitter is set to. That's it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the only t time I wouldn't recommend doing that, and this is like very rare, um, if you were doing a setup where it's like an odd shape this way rather than this way kind of setup, and you were doing like speakers lined up every 25 feet, and you were doing like zones and delays, we're almost like a football field, right? Because then <laughs> yeah. all, all those speakers would try to be receiving the signal all the way from the very, very start. So that's when maybe sometimes daisy chaining the wireless signal from one of the speakers to the next makes more sense. But I think it makes more sense overall not to have it daisy chained wireless, have it just receive the same wireless from the transmitter. Got it. The one so, transmitter. So we, yeah. so we covered three photos and, and this is great. I'm, I'm so glad you, you shared with me your, your setup. What about this last one? Like, is there anything you want to let people know about this or is it? Pretty much the same. Oh, that's just a, that's that just like another. What's that? that? About. I could see that that bag on top of your. Yeah, the, that's the, the bag. Sub. You could see it better. That's just a different view of everything. It's just the rack mm -hmm. on a little, mm -hmm. on a little table, um, and I use like one of those clamp things to mount the uh, antenna. I just mount it on the handle on the rack. That's pretty much what I do every time. Uh, if you need to get it higher, you could use a mic stand, but. Like I said, the QLXDs are so reliable, and then you throw that on top, even though it's not crazy high, it's just so solid, super solid reliability with the wireless, and that's what I'm keep on stressing. I think that's that's the goal. So I just can't speak on behalf of some other brands. I have definitely tried other brands, um, in, in especially lower quality sure stuff. They don't work for me, and I think maybe because I'm in we're in like California, and especially being in LA, maybe it's the water, just being a very crowded RF environment meaning mm -hmm. it's super hard to get a good channel anyway i had to get the best and i just i didn't want any dropouts like when i first right. got it started uh, you know there were the dropouts i was like why is it doing this and i was once that happens like the cringiness like just having mm -hmm. sitting through a ceremony and like wondering if it's going to drop out was not worth i like would be stressed out more than anything about the gig because i'd be worried about a mic system and it wasn't like i was using cheap stuff i was using the sure not entry level stuff actually even like they're better stuff but it just doesn't seem until you get to the higher end stuff that it's really the next grade so like people always reach out to me asking like can i get away with like the blx or the glx whatever mm -hmm. they are now yeah. and i have tried them um because they're a heck of a lot cheaper and especially if you're buying a whole bunch of them but they don't they mm -hmm. cut out and it was like once they cut out once i'm done like i'm not gonna even like continue to use them Right. Qu quick yeah. question for the QLXD that you use. There's different yeah. bands, like the G band, yeah. the H band. Are these Gs? These are Gs because that is what, at the time, and I think that's still the case. Uh, mm -hmm. Sure, engineers told me. So I made sure to like talk to like not even the sales guys when I talked to their team. You can actually speak to the engineers, and you could actually look this up online. Now it's super easy to see what frequencies or what band g50 seems to be the best almost actually everywhere because i think g50 is 470 ish to like 515 somewhere around there don't quote me on the exact numbers but that seems to be the most open frequencies not just in la but like everywhere because everything else is being taken up by other stuff like tv and t-mobile just did a crazy thing a couple years ago so they blocked a lot of stuff and you do not want to be on other uh bands that are being tied up that's just asking for it yeah. you probably would get even with qsd you probably would get you could potentially get a dropout so why would you mm -hmm. take the chance so do your research in your area but even like i've seen in other states it seems like g50 and i think h are the only two really available at this point yeah speaking yeah. about the sure and and just how incredible they are and, and we're not i'm not sponsored by sure are you are you sponsored by sure <laughs> No. <laughs> but but I have a when we went to Nam, I remember I, I went to Nam 2023 earlier this year. We stopped by my friends and I. We stopped by at the Sure booth, and they were so helpful. We, we were asking all the all of these kind of questions about frequencies, the difference between the QLX, the the SLX, the BLX, mm -hmm. and all of that. So yeah, I, I totally recommend for DJs to to go out to Nam which is a, a trade totally. show or conference show and down in Southern California and, and talk to these people. I mean, they're very helpful in, in, in just helping you understand their products better. And when we understand the products better, we can really make the best decision for ourselves about what kind of gear do we need. Yeah. But, I, yeah, like I said earlier, you don't have to use sure, but what I will say not to use, I will say what definitely don't use are the 2.4 um, spectrum kind of stuff where it's like, 
the transmission is digital. So not the audio, but like the way it sends the audio signal and wireless signal are both digital. And they can go somewhat far, but it's kind of like Wi-Fi. Like if you have people blocking it or if there's anything in between like a wall or something, it's dramatically decreased. Like I have used systems that claim, I, they claim 800 feet. I got like 25 feet. So, and it's just because, because it, it depends on the, like you can go like 10 gigs and not have a problem. And then all of a sudden you do, but now you do. So like, what's the point? And it's because 2.4 does not have the throw capability. And it just, it's so weak when it comes to things in between and line of sight, you have to have line of sight. And that's the, the problem with them. And they're, they're a lot cheaper because I know like, even like there's a videographer mics, the DJI road makes a few of them. Um, and even like some of the higher, higher end wireless systems from brands that, you know, have, have these like 2.4 setups and people think like that's the ultimate because then they don't have to worry about choosing the G50 or the H50, like we were talking about, because they're like, oh, it's digital. It's going to, they don't have to worry about that. But there are more things to worry about because everyone has a phone. Everyone's basically got these little Wi-Fi devices in their pocket. And actually when you have like the transmitter and you have the, uh, efficient having their phone even that can interfere i feel like so it's just not worth it i will say that is one thing i would say stay away from anything 2.4 it's just not worth it it's not reliable enough for what yeah. we do yeah man we we this is all great stuff man and i mean a lot of djs are trying to figure out this wireless game and trying to save themselves some time and uh i i hope this video is helping everyone out there so far and um and all this gear that we've been talking about there's going to be a link down in the description or you can always follow jazz on instagram and he's happy to share that link but uh, we're going to compile all the gear and put it down in that link so you can always check it out for yourself and get any of these items in case you found yeah. something helpful for you in, in terms of your setup yeah i mean i i'll include a kit that shows all the stuff that i'm using and then a couple alternatives that you can use as well there are other ways i know you have started using recently, I believe, and a lot of other DJs that I know, instead of using the QXD receivers, the mic receivers to send wireless signal like I do, you can do the opposite way, which a lot of DJs only know the opposite way, which is basically IEM setup. It's reversed where the transmitter is actually a receiver uh, and the receiver itself that receives the signal is a body pack. So mm. that eliminates that little bag that I have on top as well. Right. Yeah, so, that, that is my new ways. current. Yeah, that is my new, new current wireless system. I haven't posted up a video on it yet. Maybe I should. But yeah, it is completely reversal where that, that yeah, the box unit is the transmitter and then the body pack is the receiver. And um, I found a way. So instead of running batteries on my body packs, I go yeah. on Amazon and get these uh, two double A dummy batteries. So Same it's here. always yeah, yeah. connected to a to a power source. Yes, and I had that in the kit that I included, and I used, so that's what I use as well for, since I'm doing not the IEM way, I'm doing the traditional way, like you saw in my photos, the transmitter is a body pack on the back of my rack, and mm -hmm. that is always powered all the time through the, the dummy batteries, and those are great. Um, and definitely, if you're using the IEM route with a powered speaker, I 100% recommend doing that. Do not use, there's no point in using batteries. <laughs> you're like you're just wasting you're wasting your time but speaking of batteries one thing i will add to the ceremony is one thing i like about the qxd and ulxd and i think slxd does this as well not positive but i use the batteries themselves and the handheld or in the body pack transmitters that i use that i have the lapels on or any microphone i use the sure rechargeable lithium battery so no double a's and what's even better about that is I never even have to take it out because you can charge the QXD microphone and the body pack like in a little cradle. And I put that on my mm. kit. I don't know if you have seen that, but I haven't checked it out yet. I, I will though. So, yeah, I never have to buy batteries. I never have to take the you know battery door off or whatever it is. They just go into the cradle and at every gig, I have a hundred percent charge pretty much right away. So even if I get there, I just put those things on and within like 20 minutes, they're charged enough. Um, because they're just, you're never having to deal with switching out batteries. And so it's all about efficiency and convenience. And so that's why I said it, it can kind of get expensive to do this, but once <laughs> you do it, it, it really does. There's no, there's no like denying that it, it isn't, but it's all about a time. We're like, how can we be 
in and out of these venues as fast as possible, but also providing the highest end sound. And I will say this to DJs, like if you think you've got like the top of the line skills and like there's nothing you can improve on, first of all, I'll probably disagree because we all improve on something with the DJing, but use this to your advantage as a way to charge more. Just say we're providing top of the line ceremony sound and make that a selling point. If you know, I'm not always an advocate of like selling your equipment, but you're selling more of a service. Don't talk about the equipment you're using, talk about why and what you're delivering creates a better experience for you and the guest. And so use that to your advantage and use that to charge more. I mean, you have a better ceremony sound, so you're going to charge more. It's an easy way to charge more, just like overnight right there without even brushing up on your skills. You're going to become a better higher end service because you're offering a higher end sound. Man, you know we, yeah. we can go on on all these uh, other tangents. <laughs> I know we we, we focus know. all heavily on wireless <laughs> sound ceremony setup, which is great, and <laughs> and maybe in a future discussion, maybe we can talk about doing exactly just that, raising your rate and selling. And um, totally, I mean we we all we all have our own experience on how we tackle that that problem as as DJs. Uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe you can save that time for another time <laughs> for sure. So yeah, we can, but, we can dive into all stuff. Yeah. 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 So this has been great. I know we've been going for about 50 minutes or so. Um, we're going to wrap things up. Uh, yeah. but yeah, definitely links down in the description below for all of that ceremony gear from DJ jazz. Uh, just to wrap things up. I mean, is there anything you want to share anything last things you want to share any other tips or inspiration, anything that you want to share to other fellow DJs out there who want to learn more or get into this game? What do you have to say? Um, follow, obviously you're following Mojo. Follow me on Instagram. It's at uh, DJ Jazz. It's DJ J A S Productions. And follow like-minded people, I think. Um, and I don't just mean follow them on Instagram, like truly follow, like go to gigs with other people, meet up with other people, other DJs that are doing stuff because, you know, Try not to think of like when you meet with people, it's more community than competition. And even like us, like we've learned from each other and we both made ourselves better and higher in service because we teach each other things. And I think people like to over, they just don't, they think that's not important or they don't want to share it. And really, if we can make the industry as a whole better by offering a higher in service, again, we can then charge more because we're all offering an upscale higher in service. So it's in our best interest to show off what we're doing and not convince other people that hey this is the way you should do it because I, again i don't want to come off like that but maybe suggest other ways better ways that you think are better for everyone and more efficient so that we all are delivering a better service a better product if you will mm -hmm. so yeah that's what i would well, say I, i'm glad we connected man like we, we, there's yeah. so much things that we could share and talk about and i think that's how we, we help each other grow and, and kind of say hey what, what's everyone doing and i mean at the end of the day totally. we're, we're helping our clients to really enjoy their special day uh, on their wedding day. And I mean, these are just tools of what we use. And I'm sure there's many ways how to get the end result. And this is probably just one of them, but it has worked. It has worked really well for you. Yeah, maybe on the next one or something, or if people want to reach out, I know when we made that Bose T4S uh, mixer, I've actually had a lot of people, I don't know if I've told you this, like tons of people actually reach out to me directly, like other DJs. Um, and I've helped them dial in that T4S or explain them why I think it's necessary in greater detail than even like here on the chat or on the video that I did back then, because I do think that is the secret sauce that makes it. I'm going to keep on saying that. So having that, par <laughs> yeah. having that parametric EQ uh, is what makes it. And so, yes, there are other mixers that do that, although there are very few digital mixers that offer that capability. And the goal is I wanted something super small. So if you guys will ever want to reach out to me, hit me up, I will be glad to kind of guide, hold your hand on how I do it. Because I will say, you don't want to buy this equipment and just like take it out and gig with it. You would absolutely want to practice and get comfortable with it before you start using it. I mean, you can say that about any equipment, but definitely with sound reinforcement kind of situations, you definitely want to practice dialing in your sound before you go live. Yeah, I, definitely yeah. With, with anything new, right? You definitely want to anything practice your, your gear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, totally, totally. thanks for having me on. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so, and guys, I hope, if you found value in this video, if you want me to do more of this, put it down in the comments down below. Any takeaways and any other questions? 
Um, if you have any question, I think just reach out to Jazz directly or leave it down in the comment. Yeah. Maybe he can read it out. But yeah. yeah, we'd love to see some some interaction down in the comments. Show some love on Instagram and let us know what you want to see next. Uh, and for those people who are also interested, I have another side thing called Wedding DJ Mastery where I help DJs just like you do this full time and really know, learn how to brand yourself, sell yourself and becoming a better DJ and MC. So check that out, links down below, but we're all helping each other out, helping us grow in the industry to serve our clients better. But um, Jazz, thank you so much, man. Thanks for your time and sharing your, your knowledge you. with us. My and um, hope to see you again next time. All right. Yeah. See you soon. Cool. All right. All right. Everyone else. Thank you so much. I'm DJ Mojo saving the city one party at a time. I'll catch you in the next video. Take care.